You're listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. This week's message is preached by Pastor Scott McGrady. If you take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, we'll be looking at verses 6 through 11. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Last week, as we went over Paul, following up his statement on how, where sin increased, grace abound all the more. And he followed that up, making sure that no one could turn around and make the claim that what Paul is teaching and saying was that one should continue on in sin so that grace would increase. So what we read was, Paul say, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And what was his answer to that? By no means. And we said that Paul's wording there, which we've seen before already a few times, and we'll see it again a few times here in Romans, that that is the strongest negative he could use in the Greek. That you could translate it as him saying, absolutely not. Do not even think such a thing. He goes on to say, how can we who died to sin still live in it? And the obvious, obvious implication that he's making there is to say we can't continue to live in sin. And we can't. As Paul went on to show how we who believe have been united with Christ, having been immersed into Christ as our representative, so that we are in Christ, in his death, and therefore buried with him, so that just as he was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. So we see there in verse 4, and then verse 5 says, For if we have been united with him in a death like this, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Again, a resurrection that is by the glory of the Father. So what we see here and what we've been seeing as we've talked about Christ as our representative is that you who believe in Christ, you died, dying to sin since you were immersed into Christ's death. And so now then, you have a new life. You have the resurrection life. And then if you have a new life, having died to sin, how then can you continue in sin? How can you be settled in your sin? You can't. You can't. You can't go on loving your sin. You can't go on comfortable in your sin. If you died and are now living the resurrection life. Because that's a new life. That's a life of another kind from the one that you were living before Christ saved you. This is a life then that goes to war with your sin. So let's make it clear, as we already have before. So I know you know the answer, but it's always good to make things clear. Is the saying then that those who are in Christ, those who are saved, are those who never sin? No. This is not sinless perfection that we see here. Matter of fact, that becomes clear as we get to chapter 7. Actually, I would argue that the reason Paul follows up what he says here in chapter 6 and the beginning of chapter 7 with talking about his own continual battle with sin is in part, at least, to make sure that we do not draw wrong conclusions. And so we have to understand, the question is not, do we still have sin? Because we all still have sin. But neither is the question, are there still besetting sins in our life? That's not what we're asking here either. If we have died to sin, the question then is, as we see John Owen ask, do you mortify the sin in your life? Do you make it your daily work? That's the question. 
That you're not living in sin, you're seeking to kill your sin. Is that what you're doing? Now that you live the resurrection life. Owen goes on to say, Always be at this work while you live. Do not miss a day from it. You need to be killing sin or it will be killing you. Being virtually dead with Christ, being made alive with him, will not, will not excuse us from this work. And the apostle tells you what his own practice was. I subdue my body. I bring it into submission. I do it daily, he says. It is the work of my life. I do not omit it. This is my business. And if this was the work and business of Paul, who was so exceptionally gifted in grace, revelations, enjoyment, privileges, and consolations, well beyond the ordinary believer, why would we be exempt from this work and duty while we are in this world? And why would we? Well, we wouldn't. And that's his point. And he's correct in that. He is, he's absolutely right. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you know he died as your substitute, your representative, to take on the wrath that you deserve, that he died your death to sin, if you believe that great power in which God raised him from the dead, which then raised you to the newness of life, If you know all of this grace that has applied that, supplied it to you, is your heart not full of gratitude? Does it not put you in an awe of the love, power, and greatness of this God that you would want to live for him? That you desire to please him by putting the sin that remains in you to death? Is there no motivation to kill your sin? No change that demonstrates that you have indeed died with Christ and so are dead to sin? If you are truly believing in Christ, there must be. There must be. If you died to sin, how can you not be striving to put sin to death in your life? If you died to sin, how can you live in it any longer? And so that brings us to where we are here this afternoon in Romans, Romans chapter 6. And so if you would, read along with me as I read out loud verses 6 through 11. Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So Paul now states what he has already said before, but he's, he's elaborating on it. In saying that we were immersed into Christ. Remember, we, we said that because as we saw last week in the first five verses, he says you have been baptized into Christ. Right? And what do we say? That, that word baptized, baptizo in the Greek, it, our English word is really transliteration of that Greek word, and that word means immerse. And as we read Paul say that we are immersed into Christ, so that we were in Christ's death, we said how this is not referring to water baptism. This is referring to our conversion. This is referring to that moment we put trust in Jesus Christ to be saved. There is not a drop of water in this passage. But we were in Christ, in his death, as he is our representative. And so baptized into his death, as we read, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. And so there at the beginning of chapter 5, we see in verses 3 through 5, Paul is talking about the implications of Christ's death and resurrection for us who believe. 
for us who are immersed into Christ. And so again, he's expounding on that as we look at verses 6 through 11. And he begins to expound on that by talking about how we died with Christ. He said we died with Christ, and so when we come to verse 6 here, he says our old self was crucified with him. When Christ was crucified, taking on, him, taking on all of our sin on himself, that he took all we deserve for our sin, when he was crucified, we were crucified. And so that's how Paul could say we died with him. And you know that old hymn, right? That asks, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? And for everyone believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, your answer is, yes, I was there. I was there in Christ Jesus. I was there because he is my representative. And so when he was nailed to the cross, I was nailed to the cross. When he was laid in the tomb, I was laid in the tomb. When he rose again, I rose to a new life. I was there in my representative, Jesus Christ. And so as Paul is explaining this here, saying that we were crucified with him, uh, look there what he says in verse 6. He says, we know that. Or literally, it says, knowing this. And knowing is in the first person plural. We know this. We know this. This is true. This is a fact. We know this. And again, what is it that he's saying they know? Him and his readers. It's not just the fact that we have been crucified with Christ. But it's that we have been crucified with Christ for the purpose of, or, or as it says here, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. That the body of sin, you could say, might be annihilated. That it might be rendered powerless. It might be destroyed. Now, there's some debate on exactly what Paul means by the body of sin. It would seem Paul refers to the old person, that person that was under the dominion of sin, that, that old self that was crucified with Christ. Uh, some argue that he's talking about the old nature, but he usually talks about that differently. He usually uses different words when he refers to that. So it would seem he's talking about that one that died with Christ, that person that we used to be. That person, the body of sin was annihilated when we died with Christ, crucified with him. And this being the case, as Paul says, we know this. The question then to you and I is, do we know this? Do you know this? That you were crucified with Christ so that the body of sin would be annihilated, would be rendered powerless, and that was the case so that you would no longer be enslaved to sin. Do you know this? And when I ask, do you know this, it's not just, you know, do you, do you know it, do you have the head knowledge of it? Or it's not just, you know, can you, can you make a, uh, a mental assent to this truth? Can you acknowledge it? And that's not what's meant by asking, do you know this? The question is, do you really know it? And show that you know it because it affects your life. Because it impacts how you live. Because it is so true as you know it so well and believe it so deeply. Do you know it? You were crucified with Christ. The old self crucified with Christ. And even as he talks about the old self, uh, that word old there, it refers to that which is obsolete or inferior. 
that person you used to be that was crucified with Christ is now inoperative. So that your old person would be annihilated. And so see, this is talking about a change. That we're not who we used to be. That old self is who you used to be, crucified with Christ. And now since Christ lives, you live to the newness of life. This is talking about a change. You're not who you used to be. You're not that person who is represented by Adam anymore. You're not that person who is enslaved to sin under the dominion of sin anymore. That's not who you are. There's been a change. There's been a difference if you really believe, if you're truly saved. And so if you're saying, yes, I I am in Christ, I was crucified with Christ, and yet you look at your life and you don't see a difference, you don't see a change, you still love your sin, you have to ask why. Are you really trusting in Christ? Have you really been saved? If you continue on in your sin, it at least begs the question, Or maybe it is that you're not believing something rightly. Uh, Maybe there's an area of ignorance that that you just don't know. Something that you've been misinformed about. So, for example, I remember uh, hearing about in high school and through college, and and I I know this debate rages on, even though I think it, it takes, like, everything else. As it goes, it takes different forms. But there was always the debate of whether or not there was such thing as the carnal Christian. And the thought behind that was that, you know, I I live this new life, I'm in Christ, but when I sin, you know, that's not really me, the new person in Christ, that's my old self, that's my old nature, that's the one who sinned. And so I have these two natures that I could slip in and out of either one of them at any time, and so when I sin, that's that's not the real me, That's, that's the old self that's dead with Christ that I still carry along with me. And in that, there was this this disconnect and, and this false dichotomy, almost as if well, when I sin, and that's my old self, I, who am in Christ, I'm not really responsible for that sin. And, and so it doesn't really mean anything about my walk with the Lord or anything like that, I, and, and really gave an excuse to go on sinning. And, and the, the justification for this teaching was that we see in 1 Corinthians, Paul calls the Corinthians carnal. And so, see, they're they're carnal, so there's such thing as a carnal Christian that can just go on in their sin. But that's not what Paul meant. That really doesn't fit the context at all. That's not what Paul teaches at all. No, if you are not who you used to be anymore, how can you go on as if you are who you used to be? If you're not a slave to sin, how can you go on as if you are a slave to sin? If you're no longer of this world, how can you continue to live as if you are of this world unless you are of this world? And so again, like I said, maybe maybe this should raise the question, maybe I haven't truly put my faith in Christ. Maybe I've given mental assent to these truths and these ideas, but I have not really relied on them myself. I have not really entrusted myself to these things, surrendered to these things, these truths about who Jesus is and what he has done. I have not truly trusted in Jesus for my salvation. Maybe. Or again, maybe you've been deceived into thinking, well, no, sin can still prevail in the Christian's life. And go on unchanged. And so you need your thinking corrected. And I, I'm going to argue, as we'll see, I'll bring it all together at the end. I think Paul's bringing this right thinking into play here. So what we see Paul is teaching and saying is that the old self, again, was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin would be destroyed, so you are no longer a slave to sin. So just as it's true that Christ, as a historical reality, was crucified, dead, and buried, so too then it's true for you who believe that you 
have died to sin. That you who was a slave to sin, who was in Adam, is dead, and therefore the you who lives is no longer bound to sin's demands. Though sin still pulls on your flesh, as it does mine. Though the old desires creep up in all of us. We must realize, we must believe that we are actually free from it. That we do not need to obey because we are no longer sin's slave. We've been made new. And there in verse 7, Paul goes on to explain why he says that we are no longer enslaved to sin. As we read there, he says, For one has died, for one who has died has been set free from sin. And actually, as as Winston pointed out this past Tuesday at Men's Bible Study, as we were comparing what we're going over in 1 John with what we're going over in Romans, Winston pointed out that this verse here could also be translated as, For one who has died has been justified from sin. It's the same word set free here in verse 7. It's the same word we've seen a few different times here already going through Romans. Like we saw it in chapter 3 verse 20. It says, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight. And in verse 24 of chapter 3, we see that we are justified by his grace as a gift. And in chapter 5, verse 18, it says, Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, or as we said, you could translate it as one accomplished righteousness, referring to Christ's total life and death. This word referring to the legal standard being met. Again, it's all the same word of what we see here in chapter 6, verse 7, as translated as set free. And why? Because this this legal standing releases us from sin. This legal standing being justified with that standard met. One then is released from sin, not just because they died, but because they died with Christ. See, because it was Christ who met the standard. It was Christ's righteous life. It was Christ who who met the standard of the law for sinners. The law that demanded wrath and death. So we are legally released from sin as the standard is met in Jesus Christ. As it's met in his death. We died with Christ. And so released from sin, sin no longer has any claim on us. And so no one who has died with Christ has any obligation to obey sin. Anyone who died with Christ is no longer under sin's control. Yes, again, we still have this fallen flesh, this unredeemed part of us that we continue to wrestle with and will always wrestle with until we see Christ in all of his glory. And then we will be glorified and fully made new. And the more I wrestle with my flesh and wrestle with temptation and sin, the more I long for that day to see Christ and be fully made new. That everything I do will literally please him because I'll be made like him. Do not look forward to that day. Do not greatly anticipate that day. Do you not want that day to come? And so live in light of that day? We do. We do if we believe. We do if we've been made new. We want that day when we sin no more. As we know, as we sing sometimes in a hymn, saved to sin no more. But right now we're still weak. We're still weak in our resistance of sin. We're still great in our propensity to sin. 
in our natural selves, in our, our fallen human nature. But we must know there's no obligation to sin. And we must know it is possible for us to say no to our sin. But again, we'll see, because of our own weaknesses, we need then to depend on the Holy Spirit's work in us. We need to remember we don't wrestle alone. We are not left to our own capability to fight sin. And that becomes crystal clear as you continue through Romans. And that being the case, we must depend on the work of the Holy Spirit in us. We must look to his transforming power, the transforming power of his word. Depending on him in prayer. We do ourselves no favors when we deprive ourselves from his word and from prayer. We're being self-reliant then. And heaven forbid, there's nothing in self to rely on. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit. At the same time, if we harbor unrepentant sin, that itself will keep us from the word and keep us from prayer. Uh, There's a quote that's been uh, very popularly um, credited to D.L. Moody. Uh, I've also seen it credited to John Bunyan. Uh, I don't know where it originates. But nonetheless, it in general is true. When they say the Bible will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from the Bible. But again, we're not left to our own capability to fight sin. We do have God's word. We do have the indwelling Holy Spirit if we're saved. God has given us all that we need for life and godliness. And so we have to see that we we must look to the Lord in our dependency on him for our resistance of sin. And and we see that as we go. But but right now in this passage, uh, Paul's point is that we are not subject to sin's power nor are we under sin's dominion any longer. That's Paul's point here in chapter 6. So moving forward, having been saved, this is something we need to know. This is something we need to recognize. When our fleshly desires rise up, we do not have to give in. We've been released from sin's power and reign. Having been crucified with Christ, we have been set free from sin. And Paul's point here is clear. If we've been set free from sin, if we have legally been released from sin through the work of Jesus Christ, then we are to cease from living as if we are still in bondage to sin. Because we're not. And then coming to verse 8, we see Paul begins a new thought. And he introduces this thought with a conditional statement. In verses 6 through 7, again, Paul explained further the implications of Christ's death for us who believe. And so beginning in verse 8 through verse 10, Paul then begins to explain further the implications of Christ's resurrection for us who believe. And so we see there in verse 8, he says, now, which again is, is starting a new idea, now, Now, if, and so there's the condition here, if we have died with Christ, if that's the case, if that's true, and for the believer it is, so you could say, since we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We saw last week that if we were immersed into Christ's death, we were buried with him for the purpose of walking in this new life due to Christ's resurrection, So now we live as Christ lives. We live with Christ just as we died with Christ. And many point out that living with Christ, it's in the future tense. We will live with him. And it's true that this new life is a future life, this resurrection life. But this future resurrection life is a life that we begin to live right now. 
And it's clear from the context, Paul is concerned about the believer's current living. We live this resurrection life, this newness of life. We begin to live now. You begin to live at the moment you put your trust in Jesus Christ to save you. And therefore, we share in the resurrection life. So the believer who has had the penalty of their sin paid for in Christ, having died with him, then must believe, must be convinced of the fact that they now live this life. And this resurrection life is fundamentally different than the life you lived before you were in Christ, before you were saved. Again, you're not who you used to be. And if you're not who you used to be, how can you continue on as if you are who you used to be? All right, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You're not who you used to be anymore. You're new. And the life you live is the newness of life. A different kind of life than you had before Christ. It's the resurrection life. If we died with Christ, then we believe, again, we have this unmoved conviction that we will also live with Christ now and forever. In believing that we will live with Christ now and forever, we do so, as you come to verse 9, we do so knowing that since Christ has been raised from the dead as an actual historical event, having been raised from the dead, Christ will never die again. We know this. We believe we have this new resurrection life, this this life in Christ, knowing Christ will never, ever die again. That the authority and control of death is no longer over him. Because he's broken the chains of death. This is what's meant when we read in Colossians that Christ is the firstborn among those from the dead. And he's the first to rise from the dead. Now we may say, well, what do you mean he's the first to rise from the dead? Weren't there others that rose from the dead before him? I mean, didn't Jesus himself, uh, in one of his most well-known and famous miracles, raise Lazarus from the dead? And there are others he raised from the dead? I mean, there's one time in the Gospels you read about when Jesus just stops a funeral procession and raises this widow's son right up out of his coffin. And even before Jesus ever came, you have in the Old Testament, for instance, Elijah, who raises another widow's son. What about them? They rose from the dead, so so how can it be said that Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead? Because all of those that rose from the dead before Christ rose only to die again. Jesus is the first, and so the prototype of all of those who will rise to never die again. And so there's a very true sense in which we could say that really those before who rose again only to die again, uh, they were raised from the dead by resuscitation. Where Jesus is the first to be resurrected. He is the one who defeated death. And so death can no longer have any hold on him. He is the victor over death. Death's chains have been broken. And so if, if our living this new life is because Christ has risen and we were in Christ when he rose so that we have this new life, then to say that Christ will never die again is our hope to continue in this new life. Because our life is in Christ, and Christ will never die. So we will never go back to that old life. That old life is dead and buried. And we are new forevermore. Because Christ lives forevermore. Our new life is in him, in his resurrection life. What hope is this? What change is this? Radical difference. So therefore, 
we should understand that we can't go back. If we have this resurrection life, we can't go back to living as if we don't have it. We can't go back to being who we used to be because we're not. And we never will be. Because this resurrection life is in Christ who forever lives. That's the point of what Paul's saying here. That's what he's getting at. Remember, death is the result of sin, as we saw in chapter 5. And death reigned through sin over all of Adam's race, even before the law was given through Moses. And the proof of that is the fact that everyone between Adam and Moses died. But by his death, Christ has emptied sin of its power over us. And by his resurrection, we have risen to the new life. A new life that is now and forever. So don't think you can go back. Because you can't. Don't let sin tempt you to think you can go back. Because you can't. And this is all explained further there in verse 10. As we read, For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. His death was in respect to our sin. The sin of all who believe. He he took on himself the just penalty of our sin. He took on our wrath in our place. And he did it in that one conclusive act of substitutionary sacrifice that has no need to ever be repeated or reoffered again. Because that one act was sufficient for us. That one act is our salvation complete. This is why the Roman Catholic Mass is utter blasphemy. Because in the Roman Catholic Mass, Christ's work is rendered insufficient. Because the Roman Catholic Mass says that Christ's work has to be re-offered and re-offered with every Mass. It is blasphemy. To say the work of my Lord, his work to save me wasn't enough in itself, in that one-time accomplishment. That we need to keep offering it again and again. It's heresy. No, his work was sufficient. Does not need to be reoffered. He died for sin once for all. We read in Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 to 27. It says, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need like those high priests, those Levitical high priests in the Old Testament. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. And the author of Hebrews is writing this as he's explaining how Christ saves to the uttermost. He saves fully and sufficiently all of those who draw near to God. And then in chapter 10 of Hebrews, verses 10 through 12, we read, And by that, and and, and this is in reference to the establishment of a new priesthood, doing away with the Levitical priesthood, The priesthood then that is now is that which Christ is the high priest. And by that, we will, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And the idea here is that he sat down because his work was done. It was finished. 
In the Old Testament, in the temple, there was no seat, no chair in the temple. When the priests were on duty, they never sat down because their work was never done. Atonement for sin had to be made and remade. Looking forward to that one-time sacrifice by the coming Messiah when he offered himself on the cross. His work then was finished. He died and he rose again to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. It is done. In dying and rising, Christ overcame the power of sin and death for all who believe. Death reigned through sin and Christ, for our sake, took our sin on himself and he subjected himself to the power of death so that he would put away our old self, rise and break the power of death. And so therefore, since we have risen with Christ, since we are alive with him to live this resurrection life now and forever, the power of sin is rendered powerless towards us. So if we have died with Christ and so are raised with him, we are to live that resurrection life. And that resurrection life, which is the Christian life, is a life that is dead to sin. When temptation rises and we feel the pressure in our flesh and we feel the draw in the pool, it can lie to us and make us think that we're actually alive to sin and instead then dead to God. But no, we see here that we are dead to sin. That's the resurrection life. That's the Christian life. But we have to be careful with our our focus and our thinking in all of this. Because we could be caught up in this and start thinking that the resurrection life really just means avoiding sin and saying no to temptation. And if all of our striving and our thinking, all of our pursuit is just avoiding immorality, then we're actually going to fail at at avoiding immorality. Because we have to understand that there's not just the avoidance of the negative, but there's also the pursuit of the positive. We have to recognize that. Because the resurrection life is not just being dead to sin. Because the truth of the matter is, Christ, who lives, he did not only die, but he rose, and being alive, he is alive to God. So then the resurrection life, living with Christ is a life alive to God. As Christ rose by the power, by the glory of the Father, so then Christ's resurrection is for God's glory. And that means then living the resurrection life is living for God's glory. Now, don't get me wrong. Avoiding sin, killing sin in me, doing away with all that remains in my life that is not pleasing to God, that does not honor him, is glorifying God. So don't get me wrong. But, but we can get so caught up in the focus being not sinning and getting rid of sin, that's really all we're thinking about. And it's just, oh, I just, I'm not supposed to do that. Okay, don't, don't do that. Oh, I wish I wouldn't do that. Oh, I can't believe I said that. I can't, oh... And we just focus on what I'm not supposed to do. It's what I'm not supposed to do. And suddenly this, what I'm not supposed to do, becomes a a, a begrudging work. And it's just hard and it's wearing me down. I'm just, uh, I'm frustrated with it. Joy of salvation? What are you talking about? This is just work and labor to just not sin. Because we're so focused on what we're not to do. We're so focused on the negative that we forget the positive pursuit. I'm so focused that I forget that I'm doing this to please God. I'm doing this to walk in communion with God. I'm doing this because I want to know God. And so when temptation rises up in my life, it's not just, oh, I'm not supposed to do that. It's I don't want to do that because I want to know Him. It's I don't, I don't want this in my life because I want to be closer to him. I want to be in communion with him. I want to honor him. 
I'm taking joy in him. Not the labor and so often disappointing work of trying to kill sin in my life. I have to see the difference. I'm living for God. What greater thing is there to live for? I take joy in the fact that I, I'm growing in knowing God and, and growing in deeper communion with Him. I take joy in this. How great is He? How great has His love been for me? Look at the love with which He has loved us that He would send His Son. Look at the love of Christ for us that He would willingly lay down His life. That he would take that infinite wrath on himself. What love is this? And when I see this, I can say with the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, so it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That this life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But love, would I not love him in return? Don't I want to know this one as as best I can to get as close to him with such communion with him who has so loved me? And if sin's going to get in the way of that, I don't want that. I take joy in living for him who is so glorious, so great, so beautiful, That there is nothing greater to live for than his glory and his honor. Sin no longer has the reign over me. No, I died to sin, and now this life I live, the resurrection life, I live for the glory of God. And yet it's it's not that easy, is it? We all fail. We all know the the deceitfulness of sin. We know God is greater. God is more beautiful. God is more desirable. And yet sin somehow creeps in and and shows us and, and makes it look like it's more desirable. We know the deceitfulness of sin. We know the bend of our flesh towards sin. And so we all know this pursuit isn't easy. Killing our sin is not easy. When there's persistent temptation, when as you kill more of your sin and grow in holiness, what do you see but more sin in your life? That becomes discouraging when you're just focused on what you're not to do and trying to get sin out. You must deliberately be focusing on the pursuit of glorifying God in all that you do and don't do. We have to know and believe and hold to all the things that Paul is saying here. And that's exactly his point. Again, what have we seen going over this? Paul says here, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Saying, we know this. Hey, you know this, guys. Remember it. You know He says here, having died with Christ, we believe, we have this firm conviction that we will also live with him, live with him starting now, starting at the very moment you believed. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. We know this resurrection life is our life now and forever because Christ lives now and forever. You know this. You know it. Therefore, we need to be reminding ourselves of what we know and what we believe, preaching the gospel to ourselves all the day long. That we would know sin is not the master over us. Even when it's pulling on our flesh, when it's so strong and it feels the longer I resist, I'm eventually just going to explode. Guess what? I'm not going to (laughs) explode. What a revolutionary thought! I'm not going to explode! 
I don't have to give in. Instead of the focus being on my sin and temptation, no, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Oh, just, I'm not going to do it. And the whole time I'm thinking about how I'm not going to do it, I'm surprised when I do it, even though this whole time I've been focused on it. No, change your thoughts. Redirect your thoughts. Preach the gospel to yourselves. What do you know? What do you believe about all that Christ has done and all that he is? And then get yourself out of the way of temptation and live that resurrection life that Christ has purchased and brought to you. And in doing so, then, we, we obey the command that we see here in verse 11. The very first command, going five and a half chapters or so into Romans, the very first command we see, we obey it, as Paul says, so you also must consider, or we could say you also must count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why should you count yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus? Because if you are in Christ Jesus, if he is your representative, if you are really trusting in him alone to save you, then you are dead to sin and alive to God. So count yourself that way. Believe it. Sin wants to tell us it's the other way around, but no, believe the truth if you're in Christ. And counting yourself dead to sin, don't obey it. Flee from it. And obey your Lord. Live for his glory. So we must, brothers and sisters, be preaching the gospel to ourselves. And we must be reminding ourselves, each other, of these truths. Preaching the gospel to one another. That's how we serve each other. This this helps our, our fellowship together be all the more sweeter. As we grow together and love each other and want to see what's best for each other. And so, yes, it's so important to be under the word together. But even beyond this, growing in our relationship with each other and reminding each other of the gospel. Hey, have you counted yourself today dead to sin and alive to God? How how are you doing with that today? How is that going? Where have you fallen short? How can I pray for you? Uh, Let me tell you how I failed at that today. Would you please pray for me? Help hold me accountable to that. And be there with each other. Love each other. Preaching the gospel to one another. So brothers and sisters, if you continue on in sin, and persistent sin, and and besetting sins in your life, why? Are you believing wrongly? Is there something about the truth of the gospel that you don't really know, that you're ignorant of? Look to the word. What does God's word really say? Count yourself dead to sin and alive to God as you are in Christ Jesus. Or are you not in Christ Jesus? And if you're not, if you have not truly trusted in Jesus Christ, I plead with you, do that. Do not wait. If you're not killing sin, it is true, it will be killing you to the grave, to eternal hell. If you have not put your trust in Jesus Christ, But trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Trust in him and you will be new. Your old self will be dead and you will live the new resurrection life. Live for the glory of the great and glorious God who is worth your life living. Trust in Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to the sermon podcast of North Valley Baptist Church. For the complete sermon archive and more information about the church, please go to visitnvbc.com.